unreal for the Mississippi to argue and for the judge to hold that there was no policy of segregation at the University of Mississippi. Everyone in the state of Mississippi, and I am sure almost everyone in the entire country, knew that there was segregation at the, in the state of Mississippi. And, from, and for the university to assert that there was no segregation, and for the court to find that there was no segregation, was just uh, like a, a, a land of fantasia. The Court of Appeals reversed the decision, ruling Ole Miss must accept James Meredith. The question then, as in Little Rock, was who would enforce the order, a question the court asked directly to the president's representative. It was always clear as crystal, and I personally made a commitment, knowing the president would back it up, to the Fifth Circuit sitting on bank, all, all nine of them, uh, that whatever force was necessary to, to uh, make their order effective would be applied. I have made my position in this matter crystal clear. I have said in every county in Mississippi that no school in our state will be integrated on our new government. I now call on every public official and every private citizen of our great state to join with me in refusing uh, in every legal and every constitutional way and every way, every matter available, my friends, to submit to illegal usurpation of power by the Kennedy administration. The conflict was crystal clear, but the politics were not. The president and his advisors were determined Meredith would go to Ole Miss. But Kennedy was also determined to avoid direct involvement, which could cost him key Southern Democratic support. The president wanted a political solution. Five days later, on September 25th, armed with more court orders on his behalf, James Meredith tried again to register at the University of Mississippi this time at its Jackson office, and this time accompanied by John Doerr of the Justice Department and U.S. Marshal James McShane. This is Hagen Thompson at the State Office building in Jackson. James Meredith has just arrived in the custody of federal officials and apparently making his way up to the 10th floor to register. And in they go, and we'll switch now in just a moment. The crowd is booing lustily inside the Wolfock building. They have a crowd of several thousand inside and out. Again, Governor Barnett was waiting. I took an oath when I was uh, inaugurated governor of this state to uphold and to try to maintain and perpetuate the laws of Mississippi. Gentlemen, my conscience is clear. I'm abiding by the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of Mississippi and the laws of the state of Mississippi. Once again, a governor's action had created a constitutional test. Now the question was, would President Kennedy use the U.S. Army as President Eisenhower had? Kennedy was still reluctant. Instead, he tried secret telephone negotiations with Governor Barnett. Well, now, will you talk? I just don't understand the situation down here. Well, the only thing is, I got my responsibility. This is not my order. I just have to carry it out. So I want to get together and try to do it with you in a way which is the most satisfactory and causes the least chance of uh, damage to uh, people in uh, Mississippi. That's my interest. All right. Would you be willing to wait a while and let the people cool off on the whole thing? Until how long? Could you make a statement to the fact, Mr. President, that under the circumstances existing in Mississippi, that uh, there will be bloodshed. You want to protect the life of, of, of James Meredith and all other people. And under the circumstances at this time, it just wouldn't. Kennedy used the U.S. Army as President Eisenhower had. Kennedy was still reluctant. Instead, he tried secret telephone negotiations with Governor Barnett. Well, now, will you talk? I just don't understand the situation down here. Well, the only thing is, I got my responsibility. This is not you. my order. I just have to carry it out. So I want to get together and try to do it with you in a way which is the most satisfactory and causes the least chance of uh, damage to uh, people in uh, Mississippi. That's my interest. All right. Would you be willing to wait a while and let the people cool off 
on the whole thing. Yeah, how long? But you make a statement to the fact, Mr. President, that under the circumstances existing in this, uh, that uh, there would be bloodshed. You want to protect the life of, of, of James Meredith and all other people. And under the circumstances at this time, it just wouldn't be fair to him or others uh, to try to register him. At well, then, at what time would it be fair? Well, we, we could wait. A, I don't know. It might be in uh, two or three weeks. It might cool off a little Well, would you undertake to register him in two weeks? Well, now, you know, I can't undertake to register myself, but uh, you all might make some progress that way. Yeah, well, we'd be faced with it. Unless we had your support and insurance, we'd be... I'm going to, I'm going to cooperate. <laughs> The situation in Oxford was becoming very tense as hundreds of people streamed into the area to defend Ole Miss and the Southern way of life. I love Mississippi! I love her people! I'm accustomed! I love and I respect our heritage! After the marshals had secured their positions, James Meredith was flown into Oxford Airport and driven to a secret location at Ole Miss. The crowds didn't know where he was, but they knew he was on campus. And at 8 o'clock, just as the president went on the air, Ole Miss turned into a battlefield. Of course the president's going to win in the end. He's got the whole armed forces of the United States. He can call in the Air Force. He can bring Navy ships up the Mississippi River. He can call out the Army as he did. He can drop parachuters in. I suppose he could shoot missiles at Oxford, Mississippi. So he's going to win at the end. I uh, reported to my office. As I recall it, uh, there weren't very many of the staff there. Uh, Many of them were too afraid to come to the campus uh, on Monday. And uh, later, uh, James Meredith and came to my private office, and I accommodated the registration there. It wasn't a, a cause for laughter and champagne, uh, but it was a cause uh, for, for some relief, and, and it, it was the fact that that was over with. I mean, in a way, Oxford had become the symbol of massive resistance and the final gasp of the Civil War, if you want to look at it that way. And it was over, it had ended. Sir, there's been a great deal of turmoil and conflict. Two people have been killed. Do you have any uh, feelings of guilt? Have you given it any second thoughts? I'm very sorry that uh, anyone had to get hurt or killed. But of course, I think that's an unfair question to me. I don't believe any of you believe that I had anything to do with that. How are you getting along in school, sir? Just fine, just fine. How are the students uh, that have been talking to? Has there been any reaction? Uh, no, just acting like students, I suppose. Is this a kind of a lonely life for you, despite all these people around you? I've been living a long life a long time. It was a lonely victory for James Meredith, but it was a victory for him and the country. The Constitution had held and been reaffirmed in a major crisis. Thousands of black people felt the victory and saw James Meredith as an example to follow, a symbol like the Little Rock Nine of their own power to move the nation. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Meredith. <laughs>